Hi, my name is Brandon Zip. I'm the director of R&D and the scientific co-founder for Vitality Biopharma. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about this uh, novel prodrug that we're developing uh, for inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, so first off, uh, yes, I'm an employee of the company and uh, you know, our lawyer has required me to put this safe harbor statement. So uh, if you have any questions, check out our website or our public filings. Uh, so diving right into it, so inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so really, for those of you who don't, are not familiar with it, it's an umbrella term. It includes both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Uh, these are both chronic inflammatory disorders, so it's an overactive immune response that's attacking the intestinal epithelium of the, the intestines. So, um, so there are no cures for IBD. Um, this is something that these patients are going to live with their entire life, so it needs to be treated and managed. Um, and some of the side effects that are, are seen in IBD patients, uh, yeah, chronic inflammation, diarrhea, abdominal pain, there's a lot of pain. Um, as well as there's also morphological, there's uh, strictures, fistulas, and other problems, also a higher incidence of colon cancer. Um, so the prevalence of, the, of IBD in the United States is, is really high. So 1.3% of Americans, um, that's over 3, millions Amer 3 million Americans that are affected by IBD. Uh, it's prevalent also in Western diet and other Western lifestyles. Um, so the current treatment goals for IBD consist of initially uh, inducing remission and then also maintaining it. So sort of a first line would be, you know, prescription of corticosteroids to, you know, put out the fires and decrease the initial inflammation. Uh, but of course, that can't be used indefinitely. Uh, you have other small molecules like the immunosalicylates, and uh, you get into the immunosuppressants. Um, and immunosuppressants work well. Um, except for the, the side effects of suppressed immune system and risk of infections. Um, you also have the infliximab and adalumumab, uh, which are the biologics, which are anti-TNF alpha inhibitors, which you know, Ethan kind of touched on. Um, and so despite all of these options, you know, IBD patients are still facing, you know, 25 to 40% of IBD patients will face surgery to remove part of their bowels to deal with this disease. Um, you know, some of these patients are going to require um, ileostomy bags and some for the rest of their lives. And all of this, despite the fact that, you know, we as, as Americans, we spend $10 billion a year treating IBD. So it's just woefully inadequate for the di disease state. And um, we have a family friend who their little daughter has Crohn's disease and watching her go through the treatments and she finally has it under control, but it's just heartbreaking to watch what happens to the patients as well as the families. And so um, we, uh, so another uh, troubling uh, trend is that opioid use or opioid prescriptions for IBD uh, have been increasing. So on the left, you can see uh, over the 23 years that have been monitored, uh, this steady increase in the use of, of opioids, including strong opioids. Uh, and this is uh, adult data out of England. Uh, the same data is clear in the United States, uh, if not more so. Uh, and this, I pulled this statistic out of a recent paper a couple months ago that in the United States, nearly 20% of adolescents, so 19 to 30, um, have, been, have received a chronic opioid therapy to address their chronic uh, intestinal pain. So, Enough of the depressing stuff. So let's move on. This is CanMed. Let's talk about cannabis. And so one really interesting resource is that Crohn's disease patients have this online forum called chronology.org in which they can discuss sort of the, they can discuss what they're going through, treatments that are working for them, and they can rate the, how effective the medications, you know, that they're trying and how it's working for them. And so if you look at this, the number one most effective reported treatment is medical cannabis, and this is above this is above both the best-in-class uh, anti-TNF alpha uh, antibodies, a number two and uh, further down. So, what is the data supporting the use of uh, cannabis for IBD? Um, so, a lot of the studies that have been performed have been more observational due to the inability to directly prescribe, uh, but also because of the varied legal status. But What's clear is that, so on the left, Store has reported that 
you know, in patients with Crohn's disease that are receiving medical cannabis, they have decreased abdominal pain, cramping, joint pain, and diarrhea. Uh, similarly, uh, work out of Timna Naftali's group has shown that for an eight-week course of cannabis, uh, she sees significant decreases in the Crohn's disease activity index, so over on the right. Uh, so there's this trend downward in their inflammation and their disease status. Uh, and one really cool thing about on the right is that the patients that were taking opioids for their you know, chronic intestinal pain were able to come off of them during the course of the study. Uh, shifting from Crohn's disease to ulcerative colitis, um, you know, similar results have been seen. During an eight-week course of treatment with medical cannabis, you see an improvement in the uh, colitis scores uh, as seen by colonoscopy. Uh, as well as on the, the table on the right shows that when patients are receiving medical cannabis, they're able to go off of their other IBD medications. So this all looks great, but what is the, what's the catch? Um, and so a report that came out that was, uh, I think in 2017 this came out, and this was funded by uh, GW Pharma. Uh, it's a great study, uh, and they were using a CBD-rich botanical ep extract um, but they didn't meet their, so the data looks very suggestive, but they didn't meet their primary endpoints because the patients stopped taking the drug. So they had non-adherence. And when you look at what they were giving the patients, so they were escalating these patients up to an oral dose of CBD that contained up to 23 and a half mgs of THC daily. So the patients re reported uh, dizziness and psychoactivity, and they just stopped taking what they were supposed to be taking. So psychoactivity is a real problem in patients that they don't necessarily want to get high, they just want to get better. And so to address this, Vitality has developed a new class of cannabinoids. So if you're familiar with endocannabinoids, uh, as well as phytocannabinoids, of course, uh, and then so we have created this new category that are called cannabicides or cannab cannabinoid glycosides, in which we've functionalized the cannabinoids through the hydroxyl, uh, hydroxyl on the resorcinol ring with sugars. And so we do this with proprietary enzyme and a method, uh, and we're performing this you know, production of these cannabicides at our DEA-approved R&D facility outside of Sacramento. So we've, we've generated a library of almost 150 of unique cannabinoid glycosides with different structures. Uh, and base molecules. Uh, and our lead candidate right now is VBX100. So it's a THC molecule that's been functionalized with three different glucoses on it. Um, for the chemists in the room, like Jonathan, uh, so one main change with this, is when we glycosylate it, uh, the, the water solubility increases greatly. So we have decreased hyd hydrophobicity, uh, and it's seen by three log orders of change or improvement over THC. Uh, when we occupy that hydroxyl group on the resorcinol ring, we also see a stability increase. So these compounds are more resistant to degradation. Uh, and also another chemistry term is that these molecules now have this big polar sugar head, but they still have the hydrophobic back THC backbone and tail. And so the chemistry term for that is amphipathic, or two phases. Um, and one interesting thing that results from that is that they no longer are totally happy in a lipid or a solvent environment but they're also not totally happy in an aqueous or water environment. So we see decreased association with membranes. Uh, we also see that they no longer bind to the receptors or transporters. And so the main result of this is that these compounds stay in the gut, so they don't get absorbed. So they stay in the gut and they transit through to the large intestine and then we see something really cool happen. So VBX100, with these sugars on it, makes it to the large intestine, and there are these enzymes. So they encounter hung hungry microbes. So I think Ethan's talk is a great primer for this. So we have a tremendous amount of gut microbes. Uh, predominantly, you know, they encounter the steep increase of the distal ileum and the colon. And when they encounter that, these hungry microbes are secreting these enzymes that pop the sugars off and release THC, and then it's not absorbed. So the THC, we have a site-directed delivery of THC to the lumen of the large intestine. Um, these glycoside prodrugs, so it's a prodrug in that it's THC glycosides that then delivers, and or so it gets activated and it delivers THC where we want it. Uh, this glycoside prodrug, 
pro-drug paradigm is nothing new. Um, so uh, all of these are examples of glycoside prodrugs that target the intestines, notably senicides, which are the main ingredient in Senecot or Exlax. Uh, same mechanism, they go to the gut and then the sugars get popped off and the active is released. So we have this drug that targets THC delivery to the large intestine. So we wanted to test how does this work for ulcerative colitis. So we turned to the predominant uh, colitis model in rodents. And so here you can see over on the left, this is histopathology information from the animals. Uh, upper left is the sham or the untreated, or sorry, it's a healthy intestines. Um, on the upper right is TNBS. Let's see if I've got this. Uh, we have TNBS plus the vehicle, so this is the induced colitis uh, untreated. And then on the bottom, we have induced colitis and then treatment with either VBX100, our novel THC prodrug, or cyclosporin A, which is an immunosuppressant. Uh, and both of them significantly, significantly improve the colitis scores in these histopathology. Uh, so we also see um, decreased myeloperoxidase, which is an inflammatory marker. Uh, it's uh, neutrophils that are infiltrating into the tissue. Um, there's less blood in the stools of these animals, uh, improved colon morphology, as well as stool consistency. And so one hallmark of this model, uh, this murine colitis TNBS-induced model, uh, is actually a severe shortening of the colons. And so um, these are some of the colons that we see. And so on the left is the sham or the healthy uh, colon from the cecum, whoops, sorry, uh, from the cecum down to the anus, and so vehicle is the induced disease state that's untreated, and then we did a dose response curve with our drug, and so we see this nice dose response up until a point where we don't get any additional benefit, but we also don't see uh, any toxicity incurred by these higher doses, and this is all compared to the immunosuppressant cyclosporin A. And so we're, we're treating these as a prodrug, and because they're so tightly targeted to the large intestine, we're able to greatly decrease the dose. Um, so we're able to give these animals a very low dose and then potentiate or get an effect through the endocannabinoid system at physiological relevant concentrations. Um, but we've also pushed this concentration really high, and this sort of illustrates how targeted it is to the gut. And so we gave this 1,000 milligram per kilogram dose to these rats. Um, and then we looked at the systemic plasma concentration for THC that was released. So we did see some, but it peaked at an average of 20 nanograms per mil. Uh, just for example, so a typical you know, cannabis cigarette would give someone, or the average of like 60 nanograms per mil. And to tie this in, so what we gave these animals would be the equivalent of a 75 kilo adult consuming 29 grams of pure THC orally and only getting a mild no, 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 something. So because of this window of where we're going to be dosing and the fact that there's such low absorbance, uh, really it's, it's impressive how, how little this gets absorbed and how much it stays targeted into the gut. Um, we've also done pharmacology work that shows that the prodrug VBX100 no longer binds to the cannabinoid receptors or transporters like THC. Um, and so really it requires the site-directed uh, hydrolysis in the large intestine. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to kind of gloss over mechanism of action because Ethan kind of talked on this, but TNF-alpha, this uh, inflammatory cytokine, uh, has been shown to be uh, decreased in endocannabinoid treatment or uh, cannabinoid treatment. Uh, and there's also this novel mechanism of action that's kind of recent, and that's uh, a JAK, uh, suppressor of cytokine signaling 3, uh, induced decrease or inhibition of JAK here. Um, and so I point these out because these are both blockbuster classes of drugs, and so it's intriguing that cannabinoids can have an impact on these two classes. Um, there's also more recent information coming out of uh, Beth McCormick's lab at UMass, supporting that an endocannabinoid feedback system is sort of decreasing this pro-inflammatory eicosanoid pathway, but I don't have time, so come grab me if you want to talk about this later. Uh, so just in summary, We've made novel cannabinoid glycoside prodrugs of THC. Uh, they're targeted exquisitely to the large intestine. Uh, we've demonstrated efficacy in an animal model that's accepted. Uh, and, uh, we have decreased binding to the receptors, transporters versus THC. Um, we're avoiding psychoactivity because we're not even getting to the brain. 
um, through this targeted delivery to the gut, <clears throat> and we have local anti-inflammatory action in the large intestine. Um, so we, th we envision that both THC and VBX100 playing a prominent role in treatment for IBD in the future. Uh, mostly we're focused and interested in like decreasing the need for stereo uh, steroids and opioids. Three minutes. Um, thank you. Um, and all of this with no psychoactivity and we haven't, and there's no adverse systemic, like this isn't with immunosuppressive uh, action um, or the systemic immunosuppressive action that's like standard, the TNF alpha inhibitors. Um, so in qu very quickly, just to point out, so uh, we have a number of compounds that we have intellectual property on as well as, uh, so we're focused on VBX100, which is what I just talked to you today about. Uh, and our main indication is ulcerative colitis, um, but Clostridium, so we also have data, uh, if we have data on both uh, antimicrobial activity and uh, biocidal activity for cannabinoids versus Clostridium difficile. So we see an avenue of use uh, for these infections of the gut. Um, IBS as well as, well as an opioid-induced uh, narcotic bowel syndrome. Um, so I'm excited to announce that we've uh, received funding that will enable us to start two phase two clinical trials on IBD and IBS in 2019. So we have exciting times ahead. And with that, I'll wrap it up and say thank you so much for the opportunity to talk and thank you to my team for, and everyone at Vitality. I have, uh, I've got one, one quick question. Uh, the microbial hydrolysis of, of these, is it, is it clean? Is it what, what's left in the resourcenal modi uh, after the microbial? It, it reverts back to THC. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. So there's a complete removal of the, the carbohydrates. So. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. Um, it, Dr. Rousseau may be able to comment on this as well, but there have been several studies done by GW Pharmaceuticals using um, the one-to-one -one Sativex for multiple sclerosis and neuropathic pain, and the dropout rate is far, far, far lower. And I, I believe it's probably because they start with one minute milligrams and go up very slowly. Mm -hmm. Was were these pa patients start on 23 milligrams of THC the first day? Was that in that study? No, it was escalated to that. So that was the upper the upper end of the trial. Um, and so once the patients encountered that dizziness and psychoactivity, they stuck with it, but they stopped taking what they were supposed to. So, you know, if, if the botanical extract was, you know, supposed to be a certain amount, they were just taking half of it, whatever made them feel good and had, gave them symptomatic relief. So. Thank you.